What is going on, guys? Welcome back to episode six of the Sports Corner. Super stoked to have you guys watching, listening to us, whatever it may be. Uh, back with me again this week is Corey, as you can see. Corey. What's going on, guys? Glad to be back. Also in the studio, as usual, didn't ditch us this week, Jack Sherrick is Go back. Go to hell. <laughs> I do had a show to put on for those people. I understand. Hey, let me tell you, it I was a show. I understand completely. How you doing, buddy? How, how's it feel? Be I'm good. You know, I did miss it last week, and I apologize, but I did have to entertain some people, but I'm back. I'm ready to go. Yeah. Happy to be back. You guys can't see right now, but Jack is just posing on this couch he over is. here. He's mm. he's ready to go. He is laid out, looking like a... Uh, uh, I, I, I don't want to offend Vinny too much, but looking like an Italian stallion. I, I would say so. Joey's um, backroom casting couch with some sports. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> the unofficial name of this podcast. All right. Um, also with us this week, as I said, my boy Vito is on the camera. Uh, he does not want to come on, unfortunately, <laughs> but he is here. He is ready to help us make some nice content for you guys. So, Vito, thank you for being here, buddy. And he doesn't even want to talk. <laughs> he, he, gave, he, gave, he gave us a thumbs gave up, a thumbs so up. Yeah. he appreciates it, guys. Thank All you. Right. So today what we got is a lot, a lot of baseball. We had the trade deadline last Monday, so we're going to recap that for you guys today. We got some stuff happening in baseball this week. That's a couple milestone uh, events happening, uh, you know, a lot of stuff going on, so... We're going to cover all of it right here, right now, and then we are also going to jump into some NFL stuff. I know it seems like it's the same stuff every week, but we know it's what we got to deal with here in the middle of the summer with only baseball really primarily being played. We've also got Jax coming back with the second edition of his segment, so you'll see him today. He is raring to go. Um, so I think that's about it. That's about what we're going to cover today. Uh, I want to get right into it. I'm really excited to talk about this today. Uh, MLB trade deadline recap. Corey. Oh, we should start in on me right away. I just wanted to say, are you ready to go? I'm, I'm good to go. I thought we were going to just start in on, you know. Before we do okay. that. Okay, all right. Weekly shout out here. Freshleats.com. Freshleats. Oh, my God. This week I'm rocking the number 23, the GOAT, the Mike Stud T. The Mike Stud Jersey T. Freshleats.com. Thank you so much for making this product. It's a great one. Uh, Freshleats, please sponsor me. <laughs> He's um, a jackass. Please sponsor me, babe. Come on. Uh, oh, my God. You guys are great. Another shout out for you guys. I'll keep tagging you on Twitter until you uh, recognize me. So, thank you, Fresh Leads. Please sponsor me. All right, Corey. <laughs> Jay Bruce goes to the New York Mets. How do we feel about this? Yeah, Jay Bruce going to the Mets. It seems like that is, I say, a, I, I would say on a smaller scale, but only slightly smaller scale, uh, similar to how they traded for Johannes Cespedes last year at the trade deadline with the Detroit Tigers. They are trying to get one more bat to just barely support their pitching enough to get a final push into the playoffs come uh, September, and we'll see what happens with that. Now, you see, my thing, I don't like this for a couple of reasons. Who Do they have a center fielder on their roster? The answer is no. I don't think so. <laughs> the answer is no. They got a bunch. They got a bunch of right fielders who hit the ball very, very hard. But that's yeah. They don't. They have all corner outfielders on this team. Uh, so where's the fit for Jay Bruce? I mean, I understand he's got 80 plus RBIs. He's a great bat. You have team control of him next year as well as the end of this season. But man, it just doesn't make sense to me. Well, that well that the team control beyond this year is an incredibly important aspect because. Cespedes isn't guaranteed yeah, he's to, to come back next year. I, I I don't think he's coming back either. So Jay Bruce is great insurance to have. Uh, but yeah, I'm not. I'm a little unsure of the fit right now. It certainly doesn't help their outfield defense as oh. a whole. Uh, I again, they're really banking on enough, just enough power hitting to score four runs a game and support that pitching. But is their pitching? As good as it was last year to carry I would the say, series, I would say no. I would also say I no. would say no. I mean, it's really hard to top what they did last year, but at the same time, they've had a bunch of injury concerns mm -hmm. with that st with that staff, and I maybe they're hoping that uh, adding Jay Bruce to a, a lineup that already had Yoenis Cespedes maybe get some uh, gives him a little bit more room for error. But I mean, I like the move. I can't say I'm in love with it, but I. The only reason, the only way I would have been in love with it is if they still had the pitching to, uh, if they had last year's pitching is what I'm trying to get at. And mm -hmm. with the injury concerns they've had, their pitching is going to take a step back. So they're hoping that the extra step forward in offense uh, counterbalances the pitching. Yeah, uh, 
I, I just don't. I just can't. I just can't think of a way that I like because are they going to win anything this year? No, they're not going to win. Like I don't see. I don't see a scenario where they're in the World Series again, competing for no championship. So you're kind of telling your fans, hey, for the last X amount of years, we don't make any moves. But now these last two years, last year, okay, it worked out. This year. We're just making a move so that the fans aren't on our back. But, did, but, but were they the World Series favorites? La- or They're not a World of, Series No, no, no. I'm saying last year, were they the World Series favorites going into the playoffs No, last but year? they had all that pitching. All that pitching. I'm just saying, that you got to weigh in something for a, uh, a little bit of something for experience. They've been there before, and they've done this. They've been the underdog before. And they've come out of the National League. I wouldn't say they're the National League favorite at all. I really don't think so. I think it's clearly the north side of town. He's smiling at me, but fuck him. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I think they the Mets could do it. I don't. I don't think their odds are as good as they were last year because their pitching's not as strong. But I'm I'm certainly not going to count them out. Yeah. That's my thought on it. All right. He he likes it. Doesn't love it. I don't like it at all. Uh, but, as Corey predicted last week, if I'm not mistaken, he said Bruce to the Mets. And then next, what we're going to talk about is Reddick to the Dodgers. But he was also packaged with Rich Hill. So, I mean, Corey, you go ahead and take the lead since you called this one from the jump. What can I say? I'm brilliant. Okay. I'm brilliant. Uh, yeah, I called the... Uh, last week we talked about, or last uh, show we talked about, our predictions for the deadline. And Bruce to the Mets was something I felt strongly about. And I also felt strongly about Reddick to the Dodgers. The Dodgers are pretty fed up with the antics and <laughs> injuries and lack of performance that comes from Yasiel Puig. I laugh because Yasiel Puig. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they, felt even, uh, they felt that he wasn't really worth the starting spot. They sent him down to the minor leagues as of recently. And he took his binky and his bottle with him, too. Yeah, he, he, he did throw a fit. Uh, I believe I saw a statistic. Uh, since he returned from injury, he was still hitting about 308, which, you know, is decent, but it's a small sample size. It's not decent, it's good, but that's a small sample size. And he's he's his offensive production has gone down over the years, while his defensive uh, metrics have improved slightly, but not enough to cover his offensive decline. Mm-hmm. So... He needs some sort of work yeah. on being just a professional. Yeah. Day in and day out. Baseball's a grind. It's a 162-game grind. If you're lucky, there's more than that. And you need to be able to mentally deal with the little bumps and bruises that come along and being around the same guys for 162 games. Yeah. And he doesn't seem to have that yet. Mm-hmm. He's young, and his potential is through the roof, but he's never going to be able to reach it if he doesn't... Uh, organize himself as a regular major league outfielder. Right. So uh, I thought it was a decent move for the Dodgers to make to go get Reddick and Hill. Uh, Josh Reddick, I like him. I think he's probably one of the most underrated outfielders in the league. That's because he was stuck in Oakland for however long he was, right. he's was. he been in Oakland, but yeah. you're right. Oakland made the farm system for all the major league teams just to pick from. Uh, they sent back three pitching prospects, including Frankie Montaz, who you yeah. know, White Sox. I mean, they didn't send back too much to get two guys there and help their team immediately if Rich Hill ever gets on the mound from that blister he's been complaining about for the last two, three <laughs> weeks. Yeah, uh, my best experience is with Frankie Montas, who is a minor leaguer that the White Sox traded to the Dodgers this past offseason in a three-team deal that made the White Sox acquire Todd Frazier from the Cincinnati Reds. Mm-hmm. Uh, Montas has the ceiling of a high leverage late innings uh, reliever with uh, all three pitchers that were dealt in this deal to Oakland have 98 plus mile an hour fastballs, so they can th- they can throw fire. Basically, the thing with Montas is he throw he can throw 100, but he'll also hit the backstop with it because he doesn't know where the heck it's going. Yeah, I'd say, I'd say control was his biggest problem, but hit his uh, another hindrance to him while he was in LA was. I believe in spring training it came out that he had broken ribs, mm-hmm. yeah. and that caused him to miss a severe amount of time. Uh, he wasn't my favorite prospect. He was a top 100 prospect with the White Sox. He wasn't my favorite prospect because I I just don't like hit that his ceiling is a high leverage late inning reliever. You know, if you're going to be a pitcher in the top 100, I think you should be able to start. But we'll see what Oakland can do with him. Yeah, uh, I don't think they're going to do much with him, if I'm being honest. But... Um Josh Reddick, automatic upgrade over over Yasiel Puig. 
100% right now automatic upgrade. I just think they needed to do more. I think you needed to go out and get a guy like Chris Archer. If you were the Dodgers, you needed to make a move or try and get a package for a Quintana or a Sale. I thought they needed to add way more pitching. You don't know what Kershaw is going to give you, if anything, if he's coming off the DL at all. You don't. You need more pitching help. I mean, who's who's on that roster? You've got Hinju Ryu, the, the starting pitcher. He's still hurt. Uh, Rich Hill. When's the last time Rich Hill has pitched in a playoff game? If you want to make the playoffs, I don't know if he ever has. I don't believe he has. But yeah, I, I could be wrong with that. Right. I don't. I don't think they did enough to really make them a serious contender. If you wanted to be a buyer, I think you should have gone all in. I don't hate these moves. I mean, you're probably going to lose both these guys in the offseason, but. Well, you know I've analyzed possible deals for sale and Q over the past few weeks, and in my personal opinion, the Dodgers didn't have enough to get it done uh, at the at the prospect level. Well, if they gave you Pui in that deal with Urias plus a couple other top prospects. You just laughed in the face of Puig. I mean, I, I did. If, if you're telling me Puig is uh, a centerpiece for Chris Sale, I'm going to laugh. I'm just thinking at more Quintana. Okay. Well, Quintana I could see a little bit. You would probably have to throw in more than, more than Puig and Urias, but they don't have the positional player talent mm-hmm. in the minors to really... Well, it's not your ideal. It's no, your no, ideal no, 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 no. Obviously, we talked about this a few mm-hmm. weeks ago. The Red Sox were my ideal scenario, but... Yeah. Yeah, I. They they needed to go after some pitching. They needed to give up to get some pitching. Similarly to the Red Sox, they needed to give up something to get something, and they just didn't do that. Right. Uh, all right. Next, we're going to talk about Matt Moore, the crafty lefty from the Rays, going over to the San Francisco Giants for their number one prospect and a couple other pieces, I believe, but mainly Bickford, their number one prospect, going over to the Rays in this deal. Uh, I kind of like this move for the Giants. I, it's something they had to do. You know, they had to add pitching. Samarja's so kind of fallen off the wagon here, not pitching well. So behind Bumgarner and Cueto, you need another guy to stabilize the, the middle to back end of that rotation. And with them acquiring Eduardo Nunez from the Minnesota Twins, made Matt Duffy expendable because you could play Nunez anywhere you want in that infield, you know, middle infield to third base. So it was really a guy they didn't need. That kind of was the centerpiece of that deal because he's a major league ready bat to go over to the race to get a pitcher like Matt Moore who has such high upside. Basically what you're looking for if you're the Giants is you know going into the playoffs, your top three, you're going to have Bum, uh, Bumgarner, Cueto, and Samarja. Mm-hmm. You really just need, you don't need five starters come playoff time. We know that much. You really just need that fourth guy to be somewhat serviceable, keep you in the game, and hope that you can get some hitting in the later innings and try to pull out the win in game four of your series if it gets to uh, the fourth game of like an NLDS right. or whatever uh, the series may be. And I feel like that's what that's the, their only aim at this point, mm-hmm. considering, you know, again, it's an even year. The Giants, they've won in even years. And they... They're not going to be too over reliant on their offense as much. Mm-hmm. It's going to be. It's all going to come down to that pitching and finding the right piece to get that fourth starter. Right, and they did that. I think. You know, I think Matt Moore is exactly what you described, but he has that ceiling because if you remember, like pre Tommy John surgery, this guy was lights out for the Rays. He came, I believe, the year that he was drafted. He came straight up and was in the bullpen in the playoffs for the Rays years ago. So the ceiling is there. You know, I think he's got. He could get a lot better. I, think I, lo- I, lo- I actually love this move as a baseball guy. I mean, kind of makes you wonder about the playoffs. I still don't think they can compete with the Cubs, really. But Of course you don't. No, I don't. I'm sorry. It might be a little biased, but it's what it's I think. It's incredibly biased. Well, that's okay. I'll get even more biased later on. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's talk about now Carlos Beltran going from the Yankees to the Texas Rangers. Yes, yes. This was, uh, I think I said last week that I thought Houston had to go and make the move for Beltran, but I also said I thought it would be Texas if it was not Houston. Well, one of those two AL West uh, contenders for the division had to make moves because they needed to outdo the other one. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're going to go for it, go for it. You don't. You, it, it's one thing if you sit there and don't do anything. If you're in first place and you don't really have somebody in second place coming for you, but if you're second place rival or if you're division rival who is also competing for the division they trade for um, one of these bats, then that's just double down negative yeah, on right. you because you don't get the bat that you need and your immediate opponent gets the bat that gets yeah. the bat they need. It's a lose lose. Yes, basically. Uh, I actually I like this move for both teams because yes. Texas is getting a yes. guy that can just slot into a DH, you know, that's what he does. He hits he's hit for a living for fifteen years and he's gonna be 
really good bat in the playoffs to go right in the middle of that order. That's, that's a dominant lineup. We're going to get into even more why it's dominant right after this. But the Yankees, too, they get back last year's number four pick, Dylan Tate, yes, yep. who, is, who could be a stud. I, I believe now the Yankees have eight prospects <laughs> in, the in the top 100, which is a ridiculous amount. And we're going to talk about the Yankees in yeah, a second. Yeah, we, we will. We will for sure. Dylan, Dylan Tate has fallen. He's fallen off a little bit since the hype as the fourth overall pick. But you know what his ceiling is. He can be, at the at the very least, you can be uh, a middle of the rotation like starter. Right, yeah, yeah, like a three. But if he reaches his ceiling, you know he could be a number two pitcher, a number one pitcher potentially. But let's not get overhyped for him. But he was the fourth overall pick last year, so obviously the talent is still there. Yeah, the stuff's there. Uh, just just as a matter of it, it does it come together or does it not? With him being the difference between him being an ace or a number three or a number four starter. Yep. Uh, staying with Texas, we're not going anywhere. Uh, Jonathan Lucroy, after blocking the trade to Cleveland, ends up in Texas. Also, his teammate Jeremy Jeffries, who was closing games for the Brewers, goes with him to Texas. See, this is this is a really good move for Texas as well. They need production out of the catcher. I think Robinson Chirinos was their starting catcher, who's like a 32-year-old. I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't hit at all, period. Them in Cleveland, their worst catcher production in the league. And then they needed somebody in the bullpen to help with Dyson. Uh, Jeffries isn't going to close. He's going to set a man there, I think. But he was dominant in the mm-hmm. this season. So you add two pieces that are going to help you tremendously. Not just two pieces, but you added a top three catcher in, oh, yeah. in all of oh, baseball yeah. on a ridiculously cheap contract going into next year. Mm-hmm. Uh, we talked last week about how we thought Jonathan Lucroy was just an absolute moron for denying the trade to Cleveland. And it sucks for Cleveland, but I don't have too much sympathy for Cleveland. But the fact that the te- the Texas Rangers got Jonathan Lucroy and his salary next year is five and a half million dollars for again an All Star top three catcher in all of baseball. Mm-hmm. That's a fan- that's a fantastic value for what they got. Right. I think Texas got so much better. I mean, their lineup. You're gonna have a guy with 20 home runs hitting eighth in that lineup. Like that's a joke. Like that. That should not be happening. Yeah, adding Lucroy and Beltran to that lineup. That's that's vastly improving the lineup. Yeah, absolutely. The only my only. You know, if I have to pick at something, they didn't add really a starting pitcher. Come playoffs, you're it's going to be tough for them because it's going to be Cole Hamels, maybe you Darvish. We don't know if he's going to be healthy. We don't know if what because he's been on the DL twice already, I think, this year, coming back from injury from last year. And then there's nothing behind them. They got nothing. You know, they so. could they could have gotten a guy named Quintana or if they really wanted to, throw a lot in for Chris Sale. But... I hope they enjoy getting bounced out of the ALDS or the <laughs> ALCS because beyond, maybe just beyond one starter, they right. can't compete. Yeah. I certainly don't think that their pitching competes with Cleveland in oh, any world, no, 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 no. and I still think Cleveland's the favorite in the American League, even though they didn't acquire Jonathan Lucroy. But, you know, all these teams that thought they were going to be giving up too much for Q, <laughs> for Q and Sale, they're going to be laughing when they're not representing the American League in the World Series this year. Right, yeah. So I think, you know, they're just going to try and just beat you with offense. You know, we're going to try and put up five, six runs a game and hope our pitching is not the worst ever. So I think that's basically the mindset there. I don't know if that's a good mindset because you know the value of pitching comes up. I don't agree with that mindset, but I th- that's probably what they're just thinking right now. Okay. So that was basically the biggest trades I thought from the deadline. I didn't want to go over everything. There was like 32 trades last Monday, so it's way too much to cover. Uh, you got any other trades you want to discuss real quick? I mean, other than what we got coming up here? Uh, really? No, we've got more White Sox stuff to talk about yeah. later on, and I don't have any alcohol today, so we won't worry about uh, me being drinking for this for that segment. Get but yourself. Nah, I think we're okay. Yeah, but right. uh, besides that, I really have nothing else to talk about. All right, let's, uh, let me ask you a question here. Most improved team at the deadline? Well, we talked about uh, the Rangers in the short term. I do like what Cleveland did as well with acquiring Andrew Miller, and at least they went in for Jonathan Lucroy. They offered enough for, enough for a trade to be accepted, but again, a week ago, Lucroy was a moron in not accepting the trade to the AL's number one, the AL's number one contender to get to the World Series, and I still think he would have been better off had he uh, chosen to go to Cleveland. Right. Uh, but you can't overlook what the Yankees are going to be in three years, with this, to- with their top uh, top eight prospects all being in uh, MLB.com's top 100. When they all come up, they're going to have in. They already have a fantastic young core building, right? And 
they're going to be a real threat. They're going to be the Yankees that their reputation, they try to build the reputation as in a few years when these guys come up. With the, uh, you know, we talked about how they acquired Dylan Tate, who has an incredibly high ceiling, and all these other guys that they've got down there. So long term, I do think the Yankees won the 2016 deadline. Yeah, my biggest, my most improved team is Texas. We we talked about it. You know, you add a guy like Blue Croy, that's huge. You add Carlos Beltran, that's even it's even bigger for your young guys. You know, yeah. a guy like Profar, he's gonna he's gonna value from this a lot. So I think Texas they improve most just on the deadline day in general. Uh, my biggest winner for the entire trade trade season, trade deadline, whatever you want to say, is the New York Yankees. Uh, I don't see how you ignore what they did. Brian Cashman's first first time as a general manager where he has to sell pieces. And it, I, it, he wanted to do it, and it was killing ownership to tell him to do this. But he did it flawlessly, I think. Yeah, that's the first time I believe John Heyman tweeted it out in 27, 27 years that the years. Yankees have been sellers, and you know what? It worked out well for them. They got so many good yep. pieces back. They should be back to the Yankees of old in three years. I'd say so. And you know they can always, they're always looking to spend money in free agency, so they could speed up that process depending on what they do in the next few years of free agency. We just don't know. Also, they're going to have, you know, a pretty high pick next year, we think. Oh, yeah, be, so that'll be, you know, number nine potentially in the top 100, which is insane. Right, insane. yeah. Insane. So I think Brian Cashman executed this sell-off flawlessly. Uh, he he's might not be done. We'll talk about that in a minute. But I give him huge props because this is hard to do. It's hard to get correct value for your pieces, which I think he, he, he got pretty good I would return say so. for Chapman, mm -hmm. you know, Andrew Miller, Carlos Beltran. Beltran. Yeah, I think he got good return for these guys. So props to him. They are my biggest winner at the deadline. I think you were you said they were yeah. your biggest winner. Uh, we also have the same biggest loser. I know, <laughs> seems obvious. He's smiling because he knows what I'm going to talk about. Yeah. But that's. Oh, so we're going to let me go ahead, Corey. Let me, let me biggest let me loser. So I have the Chicago White Sox as the biggest loser at the MLB trade deadline, as much as it hurts my fandom. Agreed. Yeah. Jack agrees. Jack. With him. Jack. Agrees. I agree with him too. So I'm just going to let Corey take the reins on this. You know, they traded Zach Duke the day before the deadline for Charlie Tilson, who. Yes, don't laugh. It wasn't that wasn't good. He okay. So for the people who didn't see, I'm laughing because he's hurt now for the season now. Yeah, he he's a dick. So Charlie Tilson started in center field for the White Sox the day after he got traded. Fun and fact: My parents were at that game. Your parents were at that game, and he was going for a ball in right center field, and he straight legged on his <laughs> left leg when he was trying to dive for a ball, and he tore his hamstring. So he is out for the rest of the season. He actually got a hit in his first at bat as a pro, and then he hurt himself, and he was, he's done for the year now. Beyond that, they had the White Sox had incredibly valuable assets to trade at the deadline. They had David Robertson. They had the top two of the top ten pitchers in all of baseball, and Chris Sale and Jose Quintana. You had James Shields, who was higher about as high value as you can get for James Shields at this time. His ERA was low, but he was giving up a lot of hard hit balls. You had Miguel Gonzalez, you had Melky Cabrera, you had all of these assets you could have gotten rid of and gotten something back for. And I understand holding on to Sale and Q. Those are the only two that make sense because you can move them and you, you can move them any any time. The the pitching market this off season is going to be horrific for starters. So Going into the offseason, you can uh, revisit the Yankees, revisit the Red Sox, and try to get those two rivals to compete for Sale and Quintana and restock that farm system. But beyond that, you could, you can't tell me that you turned down a trade for James Shields. <laughs> you can't tell me. he He's been pitching better if you look at his just sexy numbers, which are you know innings, ERA, runs, all that stuff. But... His peripheral pitching numbers have just been terrible. He's giving up a lot of hard hit balls, a lot of deep fly balls, and his value was the best it could be. And you can't, they got nothing for him. Right. And, and then he pitched today and gave eight runs in an inning third. So three home runs to the same guy. Well, not to, well, not, 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 not Shields Albers gave up, but too, Albers yeah. got taken deep. But yeah, you can't tell me you got nothing for James Shields or had no offers for Melky or for yeah. David Robertson, considering how valuable the bullpen pieces have been. And we'll get into that uh, in a couple minutes here, you know. I know you feel super strongly about it. Yep. <laughs> uh, get me started. Yeah, so Corey's biggest loser of the White Sox. I agree with him. I just think you had to have done more. You know, you kind of sat there. <clears throat> Rick Hahn says we're mired in mediocrity. we got to change this. And then you just did. 
didn't do anything. So, other than trading a mediocre reliever for a decent center field prospect. But, you know, it is what it is, Rick Hahn. Hopefully you get fired mm -hmm. and they hire me and I fix it and all's well. I hate to. I would hate to have to, you know, fix the socks as a Cub fan, but I would do it just for the love of the game. You know what I mean? I don't have alcohol here. Yeah, I understand, buddy. All right, let's move on. Most surprising team at the deadline for me is the Minnesota Twins. Uh, they should have been sellers big time, and they really they added younger players. Uh, they they traded in Alaska. I get that, but they just their moves weren't making any sense to me. I mean, I don't know what they were doing, what they were thinking, but I just didn't like it personally. Uh, so they're my most surprising team. Uh, my most surprising team, and it's for the negative at the trade deadline, is the Boston Red Sox. Their pitching has been horrific all year. Even yep. even da even David Price has just been not been David Price for the money that they paid him. And again, they had they, it was a match made in heaven. They had the perfect offensive prospects in the minor leagues that the White Sox coveted to go and get one or both of Jose Quintana and Chris Sale. Mm -hmm. And they decided, no, we're not going to match. Uh, the White Sox demands. So that tells me that, sure, maybe they really do value their prospects, but when they're sitting at home watching the ALCS, they're going to be wondering what we could have done differently, and you passed up on two very affordable and ridiculously valuable, uh, ridiculously skilled pitchers just to hold on to these guys when you could have gone for it this year. Right. All right. All right, now let's move into some of the moves the Yankees have been doing over the past few weeks. Uh, all of them I really, really love. I'm going to start with talking a little bit about A-Rod. It was announced this morning at a press conference that his final Major League Baseball game will be played on Friday. That will be August 12th. He will then be stepping away as a player and becoming a special ambassador for the Yankees. So, A-Rod, let's talk about how much money he's made. You, you know the number? We know the number. We know the number. Go ahead, Four hundred and fifty-two million dollars in his career playing baseball. Jack's face behind the camera is priceless right now. Uh, he's also one of only three players with six hundred home runs, three hundred steals, two thousand runs, fourteen All-Star appearances, and ten Silver Slugger awards. Yeah, he's actually four home runs away from that seven hundred mark too. Correct. So, so he's got five games. If he if he has a hot week, you know he could <laughs> he could get seven hundred. But right, but this is totally the right time for them to say, all right, listen, either you step away and we'll bring you on as an ambassador, or we're gonna just gonna release you. I think it's perfect timing. He hasn't performed since last year, like last August, really. So I mean, he's still making that money too. Oh yeah, he's they, still making that money. Yeah. For those of you who don't know. Uh, A-Rod signed a uh, $252 million contract, and then the Yankees re-upped him for $275 million. Yeah. That is a ridiculous amount of green right there. <laughs> it sure is. And uh, he's still on the books for next year. He still counts against their luxury tax, so they're not off the book. They're, they're not off the... Uh, the hook. The hook. That's the there word I'm for, the hook. They're not off the hook for next year. He's still going to count against it, so it's good for them, but it's also bad for them. He's still got to pay that money. Uh, Brian McCann cleared waivers today, so he's tradable now. Another veteran piece they could potentially move for a prospect. You know, trades can still happen in August, people. They're just different kind of trades. Basically, so, basically uh, at this at this point in the baseball season, most teams put you know seventy five percent of their roster on waivers just to see you know what they can get. A lot of it's done under the table, yeah. uh, per se, and. If a t it goes in order of, I believe it is, was it worst record from last year or worst record this year? Last year. Last year. So the team with the worst record in baseball gets a chance, the first chance, to get at any of these players, and it goes up from there by record. So trades that happen in August are by teams that either claim a player mm -hmm. that when it goes through the waiver process, or if the player passes through every single Major League Baseball team, then they can be traded to anybody. Correct. So everybody just puts these players out come uh, August, past the deadline, just to see what you can get for them. And, you know, it's not a bad deal. You don't see a lot of uh, crazy deals happen right, in yeah. August. The only one I hear, I remember off the top of my head was, I believe, when the White Sox traded Alex Rios to Texas mm -hmm. way back when. But well, if I mean, if you're Cleveland and Brian McCann cleared waivers, yeah, why not? Yeah, the catching position isn't very strong, mm -hmm. I would say. So if you can get somebody like Brian McCann when you just missed out on Jonathan Lucroy, and if you can get him for relatively cheap, you know, he can still hit. Yeah, 100%. he can. He can still hit, and I think he's got enough in his legs to give you one playoff run. So 
Yeah, some so a team like the Indians would be very interested in the Brian McCann. Right, and those were just a couple other moves the mm-hmm. Yankees made. You know, we talked about how we love what they're doing by trading Beltran, by trading Chapman, by trading Miller. So all around, the Yankees are just doing it all the right way. I think they look at teams like the Cubs, teams like the, teams like the Astros, and they see, all right, this is a route we might need to take just for now, see what we can get prospect-wise, try to add through free agency, and try to become that Yankee dominant dynasty one more time. So good job by them. Now let's talk about you know a little bit more about the Sox score. He got into it a little bit. I'm just gonna just gonna let him do it. Yeah, I'm you know how give, I feel by now. Just give my two cents on this. They trade Zach Duke, like we said. Uh, I just don't know why you didn't move Todd Frazier. You didn't move Melky Cabrera. You didn't move Miguel Gonzalez, David Robertson. All these guys should be gone. I mean, it's just ridiculous to think how you just keep... You kept every asset you had. I'm not even going to include Zach Duke as an asset. You kept everything you had after saying you needed to make a change. Rick Hahn, get your head out of your ass. Make something happen. You're going to lose your job. The only thing that I can think of, and it's probably my worst nightmare, and I've talked to this with a couple people, is that Melky's under contract for next year. Mm-hmm. Austin Jackson, if he's not hurt, is very affordable, and you also have Charlie Tilson now in center. Eaton's under contract. Frazier's under contract. All these guys are under contract. Frazier's under contract. They're not losing anybody as a free agent. So my biggest fear is that they're going to think, let's load up <laughs> and go for it again. 2.0, let's, let's do go this. for it again. And I am over it at this point i am over it you know april was cute uh it got my hopes up a little bit but i know what this team is and the only way i would be relatively i wouldn't hate them if they bought or stood pat would be if they changed managers yeah he's terrible robin mature everybody now everybody i talk to on white Sox twitter seems convinced he's gone but i don't think i don't i'm not convinced he's gone i think i've if I had to put money on it right now, I would say Robin Ventura is the White Sox manager in 2017 because I don't trust this front office to make the right decisions. I don't. And maybe that's the pessimist in me, and that's just like the super depressed White Sox fan in me, but mm-hmm. I, I, I... That see, stings right there. That's I really sure. I really see Robin Ventura as the White Sox manager next year, and I see the same thing happening again. And then next deadline, I think, is going to be where they push off everybody because they're in the last year of their contracts and they do have valuable assets, but whatever. I'm, I said I would talk a little bit about it, and I did. Right, yeah. The only thing, you know, the only thing that is kind of excusable for you, Rick Hahn, is not trading Sale and Quintana for the reasons you stated. You can trade them at any time, and you might be able to get more in the winter for them. So The starting pitching market is It's awful. terrible. The best available, best available free agent pitcher in the winter is Rich Hill, I believe, so that's terrible. That's garbage. Yeah. Uh, so that might be your oh. best move with them. But everybody else, I don't see where your head's at. I just, God, it's, it's in his ass. Well, yeah, it is in his ass. You're correct. There you go. So, go White ahead. Sox, you know, what are you doing? Hire me, hire me, hire me. And we'll move on. And, and Corey. We'll move on. We'll talk about the Cubs. They made one move on the deadline. They acquired a relief pitcher from the Angels, Joe Smith. He's a sidearm pitcher. He's got reverse splits. He gets righties out. He doesn't get lefties out very often. So... Not much to say, just another arm there. Yeah. You know, gives them more depth in the bullpen come yeah, October. Yeah, right, That's absolutely. About it. And they DFA Joe Nathan, so he'll take, he kind of takes his spot in the bullpen. They DFA Nathan to make room for Solaire, who came back finally. Uh, had a good weekend. My hopes getting back up for Jorge Solaire. You don't need him, he, and I don't think he's that good in the first place. He drove in a run in every game this weekend. And hit two bombs. I'm pretty sure Avi Garcia hit four home oh. runs this past week. So you know what? Let's 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 cool it on yeah. our let's cool it on our high hope right fielders. Okay. Yeah. Joe Smith comes in. Uh, just another. Yeah. Like you said, just another piece in that bullpen. I'm fine with it. It was a it was a good day for me as a Cub fan. It was kind of what I expected to be honest. Lots of good day for Cub fans and lots of bad, bad days, days for Sox fans. fans. Absolutely. Now there's another pe- another thing I want to talk about with the Cubs real quick. Super bias, probably. I don't know what it is. You're ridiculous, but go but ahead. But I just can't get enough of Kyle. Hendricks, this guy is an absolute monster. 11 and 7, 2.17 array, a 1.06 whip. They're hitting 214 off him. I mean, are, are we not considering him for Cy Young? We are not considering him for Cy Young, and I'm going to tell you why. I don't. Well, first of all, I'm not gonna. I don't think he's gonna win because. Number one, he doesn't have the sexy stats. I don't care about sexy. I know you don't give a shit about sexy stats, but the people who vote care about ah. sexy stats. You know, Jake Arrieta won last year because he was a twenty-game winner and had that ridiculous ERA. And Clayton Kershaw was in the running for Cy Young because I believe he had twenty wins also in a ridiculous ERA. So did Zach Greinke. Yeah, 
Kyle Hendricks has how many wins? Eleven. He's he's not he's not touching twenty this year. It's just not happening. Just seven zero, Corey. <laughs> just gonna just gonna pause for a second while I clear that out. But I looked up some interesting stats. Now they are a little bit outdated because you know White Sox fans. Do we tend to live in two thousand five? In two thousand five. Yeah, the truth. Kiss my ass. In two thousand five. Uh, Roger Clemens, when he was still around, his ERA for the Houston Astros that year was 1.87, which is a ridiculously low ERA and very, you know, comparable to what Hendricks has been doing. He's also he also was on steroids. Well, that's beside the point. Uh, Clemens had 11 wins that year, total. Uh, versus he finished third in the Cy Young voting, third to uh, Chris Carpenter and Dontrell Wilson, who both had 20 wins apiece. And both had a ERA of one or greater higher than uh, Roger Clemens did. So wins are the big, the big sexy stat that these voters look at. And that coupled with the fact that Kyle Hendricks, I looked at it before the show, uh, exiting the White Sox game, his ERA on the road was 3.75, which is, again, that's a very good ERA for what his role is. And I'm not saying that he's not a good pitcher because he is a he's proven to be a really good pitcher this year, but he's not Cy Young worthy. He Man. doesn't have the wins for it. So you're telling me he and he keeps doing what he's doing, and what he's doing is just dominating teams. He, you know, seven and a third innings he's, today. He's dominating teams at Wrigley. He did it today in Oakland. It's Oakland. You just said he did it it's in Wrigley. Oakland. I'm giving you an example of seven and Oakland. a third. Who, who hits in Oakland's lineup? Chris Tapis. And they have a ridiculously large ballpark. <laughs> You're, you, it's Oakland. Oakland's 20, I'm just games, saying, Oakland's 20 games below. I'm just saying you said he only does it in Wrigley. Okay. What and did I you just, say? Seven and a third. You know how many how many players in the A's got into scoring position? One. It's the A's. I'm giving you. It's the Oakland. They traded Josh Reddick. They traded the only offensive piece they still major had. league players. Okay. Okay, what, just because they're on a major league roster doesn't mean they're major league players. I'm, I watch a terrible baseball team, okay? <laughs> I, know I know what major league talent is. Hey, Avi Garcia starts in right field for my team, or well, not right field, as play, a DH. According to your play-by-play, he's a 5 to a player. So no, up. that's not my play-by-play. -play. That was that was the hype. He's <laughs> garbage, but that's beside the point. Kyle Hendricks is a very good pitcher. He would be greater than a number four on most teams. He would be greater than... He'd probably be a really good number three on a lot of teams. But... Just because he's having this hot stretch, you can't you can't get the Jake Arrieta mindset here, where you think Jake Arrieta is the where, they, where we thought Jake Arrieta was the greatest pitcher who has ever existed because he put up some ridiculous numbers for the last you know year and a quarter or however more until he came back to earth. Kyle Hendricks is going to come back to earth at some point. Okay, Kyle Kyle Hendricks isn't this 23 year old, 22 year old, you know, number top five overall pick in the 2015 draft or something like that. He is outperforming what his expectations were, and that's good for him. And you know what? He's really helping the Cubs out. But he's he should not be considered a Cy Young candidate. I saw you compare him to Greg Maddox. It looks like Greg Maddox. Greg I'm Ma not saying he's going to be as good as Greg Maddox. I'm did not you, saying. Did that. you or did you not ask the Cubs beat reporter on Twitter? Greg, would you rather have Greg Maddox or Kyle Hendricks? I think I asked Jesse I, 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 I will find that tweet. <laughs> okay. I will find that tweet, and I, if I find I think, it, I will put it in the description. I think what but, I said, what I said was, was that Greg Maddox out there or Kyle Hendricks? As a joke. As a joke, my ass. But I must say, I know how you are. As great as Greg Maddox, I'm just saying, the right-handed finesse. I don't throw 98, but I'm gonna get you out any way I can every fifth day. That's what he's doing. You're telling me if he wins 16, 17 games with a 2.02 ERA, okay. he's not going to be considered he'll be, for a He'll be inconsider He has 11 wins right now. Let's not let's not pencil him in for 17. If he, I didn't if, pencil him in. I said if. You say if if pen, you you did because you can erase pencil. But <laughs> if, he, if he has 17 wins and that ERA, sure he'll probably be a top seven to ten candidate for. Cy Young, but he doesn't have the reputation. He doesn't have the big name recognizability. He doesn't have a lot of things that would put him as a Cy Young favorite. If they're voting on Cy Young winners based on name and reputation, that's so bogus. It's but you know how baseball works. I understand, work. but I'm just saying 
if you're telling me that his numbers are better, and this is supposed to be for the best pitcher in the league this year. Shouldn't be anything about last year, two years ago. What's his last name? Who does he pitch for? It's all numbers. Look, I, I, again, if names aside, I would probably not have him as a top three Cy Young Award candidate. But, you know, at the same time, I don't think you should worry about him being a Cy Young Award candidate because he's going to be a pitcher every three, four days for you come October. And that's probably the best asset that he is to you right now, other than he's gonna Cy Young games. Award winner. He's going to sure, win games sure. in October. But he is not a top three Cy Young candidate. Mm, I just, I disagree. Because he doesn't have the wins, and his splits aren't reflective of a Cy Young Award winning. They're reflective of a very good pitcher, <sighs> not a Cy Young. You can't, you can't sit there and badmouth Quintana and then get mad at me <laughs> <laughs> when I badmouth Hendricks. That's garbage, and shut your oh, damn mouth. Oh, man. You're kind of right on that. I badmouth Quintana all the time. So. That's not right. I can see where you're coming from on the Quintana thing, but I think come the end of the year he's going to be strongly considered for a Cy Young. This he's he's flat out fun to watch. I love watching this kid pitch because it's it's old school pitching. He's been he's been great value at the back end of that rotation. Mm. He has been great value at the back end of that rotation. I would give you Kyle Hendricks if you're watching this. You're a beast. Keep doing you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, also in baseball today, we had a huge milestone, I believe, the 30th player all-time yep. to join the 3,000 hit club, Ichiro Suzuki. Uh, I thought it was well overdue. Don Mattingly hasn't had him in a lineup very often lately, so, you know, real, real great job by Ichiro to not come into the league until you're 27 years old, and now you're here 16 years later, 15 years later. Yep. You joined the 3000 Hit Club. It's a great, great accomplishment. Uh, he's one of my favorite players from my childhood. He's so fun to watch. I mean, I love watching the guys swing the bat. So huge props to you, Ichiro. Um, Corey, what are your thoughts on it? I mean, 3000 hits, a ridiculous amount of gold gloves. And it's impressive because how late he came into the league, like we said. I think I saw the uh, ESPN or Sports Center, somebody tweeted out a stat that the average age of a debut for 3, 000, the 29 3,000 hit players before Ichiro was 20 years old and a certain amount of days. Ichiro didn't start until he was at, uh, beyond his uh, 27th birthday. Right. So that's seven years of time that he didn't have in this league. And when you think of great players from our childhood and great players from our era, you think of you know Miguel Cabrera, mm-hmm. Alex Rodriguez, Albert Pujols, all these great guys, but Ichiro should really be up there oh, absolutely. as one of those premier players because, sure, he didn't have the power numbers, but he was ridiculously fast. He put Japanese baseball on the map in America. I believe he's the first Japanese player to get 3,000 hits in Major League Baseball. Yeah, that sounds... A, that, that I'm sure that sounds right. Um, but I know there was a little... Con- not controversy, but Pete Rose decided to open his mouth on the Ichiro Suzuki issues like... Well, if we're counting his hits in Japan, shouldn't we be counting, you know, uh, the hits people get in college and high school? No, you jackass. He is a great, great baseball player. And you know what? Pete Rose, he, he, he did it the right way. He, right. he didn't do anything illegal mm-hmm. like, you know, you did, keeping your ass out of the Hall of Fame. But Ichiro is a future Hall of Famer. Yep. And you might not be able to call him the all-time hit king, but... You, you got to wonder what he could have done had he started at 20, had an extra seven oh years God. in the big leagues. The dude is, without a doubt, one of the best outfielders from our era and a surefire Hall of Famer. Someday. Absolutely. All right, once again here with me for his segment called Jack Off the Hook. Oh boy. Jack Sherrick's joining me at the table. Jack, what's going on, buddy? Hey, guys. How's it going? Uh, just a couple things for you guys here today. Uh, we got one good joke for you. We got a couple uh, fun interesting facts with the uh, Olympics uh, this year. Um, so let's get right to it. I think we'll start with the joke just to, you know, lighten the tension, lighten the mood. Chicago White Sox. <laughs> Number one. Tell them about again! Him. Tell them again! <laughs> everything about them. It's just, you know, they started off pretty well at the very beginning of the season, and now they just fell off. Just completely fell off. Yeah. Go on. Uh-huh. Um, specifically, their 11-5 to loss uh, a couple days ago was really... Uh, and today. Yeah, that was pretty bad today. Too. And the entire season. Manny Machado. Basically. Manny Machado had three home runs today before J.B. Shuck even picked up yep. a bat. So. Yep. That's good. Yep. I mean, that speaks for itself. So there's the joke. <laughs> Laugh at it as you will, because I am. Uh, today, uh, for the Olympics, uh, some actually pretty amazing things today. Uh, just recently, Katie Ledecky just won gold in her 400-meter freestyle swim at the age of 19 and broke her own record uh, four years ago at age 15. That's crazy. <laughs> that 
pretty incredible to me. She's younger than us. Yes, she is. She's doing more with her life. <laughs> more than I will ever see. <laughs> Uh, and then, uh, was it yesterday or two days ago, uh, the U.S. wins their first gold medal in shooting. Shooting. United I States. Know that was an Olympic event, shooting down here today. Yeah. But, I mean, coincidence? I think not. Shooting. <laughs> I mean, uh, pretty good at that, right? Uh, Harambe. All right. And then our final one, uh, not so much too, uh, too great, but a uh, French gymnast, Samir H. said, breaks his leg during the qualification session. You saw that video, right? I can't Especially even that. walk. I can't. Yeah, I can't yeah. even think about that. That'll be in the description, ladies and gentlemen. Man, it was. That was painful to see. His I'm, leg was just it wobbling. Just snapped. Not as bad as Kevin Ware, but oh my God, it was just hanging there. Yeah, I oh, wanted to throw up. Poor guy. That was disgusting. And then you had to share it on Facebook. I sure did. Got to make sure everybody can see it. Let's be a part needs, of it. Does he need some milk? Yes, he does. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he does. <laughs> Oh, but yeah. And then just recently, about five minutes ago, Michael Phelps and his 400-meter uh, relay team just took the gold once again. Um, beat out France by, what was it, three, four seconds? So that their was, teeth there, yeah. Yeah, sure did. Um, so, but all right, you guys today. All right, that's all we got this week for Jack Off the Hook. He will be back next week, I think, to have another segment for you I guys. I believe I will be. I hope so. All right. I should be. Yeah. I'll be there. All right. Alrighty, Corey, it's time to wrap up the show here. Uh, we're just going to talk a little bit about NFL. Probably next week we'll get really in-depth into some fantasy football stuff. Uh, I got a draft this week, and then I think every week for the next month or two, I got drafts every week at some point. So it's getting into that season. We're surely going to get into depth with some of it. But for today, we're just going to touch on some stuff. You know, the Hall of Fame game was supposed to be tonight. First game of football since February, and it was canceled. Canceled. Due to field concerns, the turf, I think, was a little messed up. What a joke. We have to wait for more football now. Right. I think this is kind of just like a, a slap in the face of the reputation of the Hall of Fame, like ceremony, and the NFL. You can't get a field right. I mean, they had, what, 24 hours at least to do this? Maybe less than that, but I, still. I, I don't know the exact hours on it, no, but come yeah. on. It's the first football game of the year, and sure, it's preseason. But I don't even think the starting quarterbacks, Aaron no. Rodgers and Andrew Luck, were going to play. But, I mean, come on, it's football. We've been waiting months for football. Yeah, so that's kind of just like, really, come on, guys. Get it right, get it done. But it'll be back next week. I mean, I'm super stoked for fantasy football. It's yep. going to be a really good season, hopefully, for myself and my wallet. Uh, so really looking forward to that. Another thing we want to touch on is uh, if anyone watches the you know Sunday, the countdown or whatever on ESPN, you know, Tom Jackson's been a staple in that broadcast for the last 29 years. So... He is retiring from ESPN. It's sad to see him go. He's one of my favorite guys to listen to. I love the insight he gives. You know, he was a player. He's a little biased towards the Broncos, but that's fine. You know, what do you expect from the guy? Uh, so really sad to see him go. He's a guy you look up to if you want to have a, a job in broadcasting someday. So thank you, Tom Jackson, for 29 years, even though I only was alive and coherent for, like, half of it. But thank you very much. It's sad to see you go. Chris Berman, it'll be sad to see you go, too, even though I know Corey doesn't uh, – feel the same. I love Berman. I don't hate Chris Berman. <laughs> his, his, his act gets a little old. That's all I'll yeah. say. Well, when they were doing the kind of his last sign-off last night for Tom Jackson, sending it back to Sports Center, and Chris Berman was describing, because they've been together the whole way, yeah. the whole 29 years. So Chris Berman was having trouble finding the right words, and that should say something, because that mm -hmm. guy's always talking. Making so. weird noises that get old <laughs> yeah. after a while, you know. <laughs> kind of like I do. Yeah. With, yeah. Uh, yeah. We won't get into it. But yeah, and I, I bet you any money he's going to dab at the end of this, too. Probably will, I'll be honest. It's going to be super crisp. So He's, he's my Chris Berman. How about you find a new exit, huh? Why don't you a new exit? Have, why don't, as soon as you, Jack, have a more crisp dab than I do, I'll find a new exit, which will never happen. All right. Uh, one thing I wanted to touch on, Brandon Spikes. Linebacker yeah. played with the Patriots, hasn't played since 2014. Signs with the Bills. I like this. This is an underrated signing, in my opinion. Yeah, you know, it's one of those uh, low-risk, high-reward things because Brandon Spikes was a very solid linebacker, inside linebacker for the New England Patriots. Uh, I believe he, he came up with the Patriots. He was drafted, I believe, in a second round by the Patriots. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they have a great eye for talent as, you know, record by how often they're in the playoffs and they're, however many years they've won 10 games in a row, or 10 games in a season. So the, the Patriots have always had that eye for talent and... Sure, he's been out of football for a while. It's going to take him... You can be in regular shape, um, speaking as a former football player. You can be in regular shape, but there's nothing like football shape when you hit or get hit for the first time and you have to get back up. 
So he's going to need time to get back into actual football shape. But if he reaches the ceiling that he was expected to with New England, or if he comes anywhere close to that, he's going to be a great low-risk, high-reward signing. And them. if there's anybody that can get the most out of him after a year off of football, it is Rex Ryan. Of course. If there's one thing he can do, it's coach defense. We all know that. He can't, he can't groom a quarterback, <laughs> but you know what? He can He can run a defense. Sure can run a defense. We'll <clears throat> see what he can do there. All right, I think that about does it for this week on the Sports Corner. I want to give a huge shout-out to Vito for being here. Hopefully he's back. Uh, really appreciate him being here. He did a great job today. Uh, Corey, thanks for being here again, my, my good sir. Pleasure to have you here. Always welcome back. Best co-host we have so far. Yeah. Probably ever will. Uh, Jack, thanks for coming back, bud. Yeah, no problem. Good to have you here. I'll try to prepare more for next week. Sure. I know the uh, last 10 minutes really didn't get you a whole lot, but... It's all good. Oh. It's all good. All right. He's watching the Olympics. He's yeah, watching the Olympics. Yeah, he's watching the Olympics. <laughs> uh, so I think that about does it for us this week. Thank you so much for watching or listening. Uh, make sure you like, comment, subscribe. Give us some feedback. Let us know what you guys want to see, if anything else. Make sure you guys go follow us on Twitter. That'll be in the description below. And thank you very much. Have a great week. And yeah, we'll see if you, you if you if you guys think his dad sucks, you can call him out on oh, it. Man. I mean, please do. Please no, do that. That's not, that's not. Don't do that. Please, you'll have my confidence. Uh, so thank you guys for watching, and we will see you guys next week. You guys think they need a to get like a real hook? Just so that. Yeah.